Hello, everyone. Uh, so with me today, I have Professor Richard Werner and George McNee. This kindly, um, he's kindly going to be interviewing us about Valhalla Network um, and generally DeFi and sort of what we're doing and the benefits it can bring. Um, so thanks, George, um, from, from our side for sparing my time today. No Thank you. Thank you very much for the, your, your time, guys. It's a, it's a pleasure. Perhaps if you want to say a word or two about yeah. yourself, maybe for the audience might be quite interesting. Um, yeah, so my name is George McNee. I'm a Scottish-based investor, um, a student of the markets, something I follow uh, pretty closely. It aligns with uh, my background in investing, so the two go hand in hand. So naturally, when uh, you come across uh, Richard's work and, and guys like uh, yourself, Oliver, um, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities in the things that we're interested in. So it's, it's great to have a conversation with you guys today about what brought you to um, what you're doing just now. So right, it'll be um, interesting to, to hear how you uh, how he's got got together. Well, that's uh, that's from university, isn't it? Um, so I was doing bachelor's in chemistry, and then decided um, it wasn't right for me long term. So I wanted to get into banking. Uh, so I decided to do an international banking course. Richard was the course coordinator, and um, sort of well, the sort of course lead. It was his program. So he was my lecturer and supervisor for my master's and we stayed in touch from there. I always wanted to get into the small banking, sort of community banking, helping other people space rather than just work for a big bank um, and try to make the shareholders loads of money. <laughs> um, so I stayed in touch with Richard and then sort of a couple of years after my time at HSBC, I got with you on Local First and started working there. And we met George originally when uh, you contacted me and, and asked me for uh, you know, sort of my my uh, my work and whether I've got any forecasts and analyses. And I sent you my global liquidity watch report, and then you did this very detailed analysis. And you liked the results, I think. The forecasts um, came out quite well. Um, must have been a couple of years ago when you were doing this analysis. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things is that you know there's a lot of um, you know commentators or uh, self-proclaimed gurus or knowledgeable people out there and one of the things that I think is prudent to do when you're uh, looking at anyone's work is, is maybe back test what they're doing you know get a timeline of you know maybe some things that we've said see how that's panned out um, you know because some of the wording that's out there when you're looking at um, you know particularly financial commentary um, from these uh, experts is it's worded and constructed in such a way that you know it can, it can be both scenarios um, and when I came across, you know, your work, Richard, I thought this is worded slightly differently. So it stood out. And then the second thing was when we, we had a, a conversation, I think it was about you uh, had spoke with a local savings bank that was local yeah. to myself. We had a conversation about it and uh, that led on to um, your analysis. And I thought, well, let's back test this. And that was the thing that really stood out. I thought this, this is a little different here because you're able to prove that, you know, as you have said in the past, empirically prove or use a testing method where you can go, right, this rings true. And uh, it, it was great, you know, it was a great, uh, you know, a serendipitous conversation where, you know, we were speaking about a local bank and some of the work that you did and it led on from there. So it's a small world and, and great that we were able to, uh, to, to get in touch. But the thing that I noticed was how that wording and some of the things that, that you've mentioned is different from the, it stood out from the rest of the um, other uh, people who proclaim that they know what's going on. Um, so it, it was very good to see a breath of fresh air, if you don't mind me saying. The majority <laughs> of economists as well, they don't use an empirical approach. So <laughs> but, yes, even though some will claim they do so, but actually, their main theses um, are based entirely on theory, axioms, hypotheses. Just today on, on Twitter, somebody saying, but Richard, um, you know, when you lower rates, that stimulates the economy. And now they're talking about raising rates, that's gonna cause a slowdown. <laughs> so, you know, it's this interest rate thesis, which has been drilled into people's heads, whether they're trained economists or just following the newspapers. Um, and it's so extraordinary that it, I mean, when a, a few years back when I tested this um, 
thoroughly empirically with an econometrician doing the you know cutting edge econometrics um, work on this and then you you write it up you have your literature survey but there is no literature on this nobody had done this which is really crazy when this is such a proclaimed relationship but it tells you that whenever something is just repeated so often of course everyone assumes well everyone says this and they've been saying this for years so of course everyone has double checked this back tested this um but they haven't um and so uh, that that was a huge gap but of course that's the sort of thing that if you if you are spreading false information propaganda because you don't want people to find out what's really going on then you'd be using that technique of just constantly repeating things um it doesn't make them any truer but it is often hard to then you know argue with people they think they know it because surely everyone knows that you know if you if you raise rates now it's going to slow down the economy <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, so, someone asked me to explain it to them. I don't know if this would be, I don't know if this would be a good explanation, but I'll give it a try. Uh, please uh, forgive my humble attempt at it here. It says that you know when you get into these people that work out these scenarios, like the the testing method of your lower interest rates that stimulates the economy. Imagine you know that the the game the Rubik's cube, you know that the, the blocks that you need to turn and you need to get all the colours on the same face. So as a Rubik's Cube, you're, you're moving it around. If you zone in on any one of those blocks and say this particular one is, is interest rates stimulate the economy, if you look at that block, yeah, it, you know, when you silo it there, it apparently works. But it, only in that block, what you don't realise is when that block moves, it's, it's a 3D shape. And how that interconnects with the remaining blocks, it, it doesn't actually work. You know, because when you drill into one one part of it, yeah, you know, you can silo it and you can think it does work. But when you zoom out and take the bigger approach, you realise what this three-dimensional connected, um, you know, environment that it's in does it can actually fall apart depending on what's going on elsewhere. Exactly, that's a very nice explanation. Actually, just uh, yesterday on, on, on the plane here, I was. Uh, going over the final version of a paper that's not just been accepted, which is the second paper on this empirical test on the relationship between interest rates and economic growth. So one is already published, Ecological Economics, 2018, Lee uh, Werner uh, paper, Reconsidering Monetary Policy. And the second one took, again, I mean, it takes years to get this through because the journals are very resistant. This is journal number 14 accepted it. You need an editor who um, you know, it's just a bit more open-minded. They come up with all sorts of excuses why they don't like it. They don't like the conclusion, basically. That's the story. Uh, anyway, and I was just, uh, one of the explanations in there was exactly what you're saying, although I didn't use the, the Rubik's Cube um, um, comparison. It is really the fact that, of course, if you look at one project, so in microeconomics, and you have interest rates, therefore, uh, as an external factor, exogenous given, and you, you're doing your calculations as, an, as, say, a businessman with your project, and the interest rate, of course, is a key variable, and if suddenly the funding costs are much higher, there will be a point where you'll say, well, okay, we can't do it anymore, and therefore, there is a negative correlation that when you have higher rates, then the investment on the micro level will, will stop or go down. Um, and that's true on the microeconomic level, but, and I was just, you know, writing this, the aggregation is the, is the question, and nobody's proven or demonstrated that this is true also in aggregate. You're taking a micro argument where interest rates are external and, you know, the, the, this one investor, or one businessman, or one project, the representative investor reacts to these interest rates. But of course in aggregate, all investors together and everyone in the economy, they set market rates um, and therefore rates are the result. And, and also just this, this effect, it's, it's not clear that even if it's true in, in theory on the micro level, there's many factors on the macro level and many other things happening uh, that interest rates do, of course, how they affect the banking system, uh, how the yield curve affects the banking system and therefore what happens with credit creation and then the credit creation disaggregate credit going into the real economy or credit going to asset markets all these things and that really actually determines economic growth as i've shown 
is this credit creation aggregate and also disaggregated credit creation. And um, that um, can be, and, and, and actually is in reality, in an inverse, uh, well, correlation to what the theory says, which is actually a positive correlation. So what we find is that um, credit creation drives economic growth. It's credit creation for GDP transactions, for the real economy drives mm -hmm. economic growth. That drives interest rates, it's a positive correlation. And as growth rises, rates go up. And that's not a bad thing. Um, it's That's normal. Of course, central banks sometimes hold against this, but in reality, looking at the empirical data for decades, on balance, they have had to follow this uh, because rates follow um, economic growth. But investors who, or analysts, economists who don't know this chain of causation, they're stuck in this thinking that the interest rate is actually a cause of things when mm -hmm. really it's more a result or a symptom of things. It's like, um, you know, again, this maybe is an oversimplification of an analogy. It's like the, the domino effect. If you have a, a center point of dominoes of interest rates and you, you branch off, you know, 10 channels and 10 routes, you know, you can prove that one of those had the reaction you want, the other nine are, are chaos. And, um, you know, if you if you go into that particular one and use that as your, your evidence or your, um, your argument for, you, you know, you're not really looking at what else has happened that's led off that. And that's the thing that um, you know it tends to be that these opinions are siloed, where they you know almost like if you go into a buffet, they're picking the parts that they want and don't really consider the parts that they don't want um, because it doesn't really fit. You know they're using that to fit the method that they're yeah. trying to portray rather than trying to say like, look what is it that's uh, that's going on here? Because after reading your paper, the, the it, it was quite clear it was you know there's conditions that are created where when um, credit creation uh, is driven for uh, speculation, you know, it, it falls apart in terms of productivity because the, the money flow doesn't go to the productive means um, or the productive part of the economy. So the production drops and, you know, it seems fairly straightforward, but it's amazingly missed on a lot of very clever people that you would think it would come up, you know, pretty obvious to them. Um, do you, is there any reason that you think that that um, theory that you put out is, is empirically tested has been missed on those people? Yeah, yeah. Well, there is that famous saying that it's very hard to convince somebody of something um, when they're paid not to agree with this, when they're paid not to understand this. <laughs> and there's no, no uh, sort of job benefits for them. Um, but yes, and so we actually originally, yes, we, we were discussing a small savings bank near Glasgow, which sadly was closed down in a, in a very strange incident. We tried to rescue it. I was there with Servants Cable. Um, and, you know, I've been, I've been active in trying to uh, revive and establish and, and uh, set up community banks for a while. Um, and so, uh, George, you are, again, uh, engaged uh, with us and, and backing this um, this idea, and that's of course something we, we want to talk talk about today. Yes, I mean, for everyone that isn't that isn't a, you know aware of what you have put together, it'd be great for you know to hear uh, from you guys how out of all the all the banking and all the world of the finance that you could have went into, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it would be, it is fairly apparent that there is many branches and many parts of this you could have picked. Yeah. Why this yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the, the interesting thing is, I mean, that we've had essentially since, well, since my book, New Paradigm in Macroeconomics came out in 2005, um, soon after this is, you know, this, this new, this era dawned of Bitcoin and then other alternative currencies, cryptocurrencies, and a lot of people actually then getting interested in the money creation process mm -hmm. and what's behind this. Um, and then saying, well, we need to decentralize this and we need to have, you know, sort of people's money that's issued. Everyone can issue their, their token. Everyone can issue their cryptocurrency uh, sort of thing. Um, but often people not realizing, um, you know, all the, well, as you say, the, the many implications, it's, it's again the same issue that you have, you know, you hold everything constant, 
and you just look at one thing, you think, okay, we'll, we'll improve that, but how does it affect the rest? How does it fit in? That's exactly what you're saying. Actually, economists call this the, the ceteris paribus assumption. Ceteris paribus, the other things being equal. So you assume everything um, is unchanged, only one thing that you're interested in is going to change. And um, I mean, it's true also in this, um, in this alternative currency um, environment, I think. Central banks, of course, like to talk about cryptocurrencies. Um, I mean, apparently, because they sort of, they say, well, we're, we're concerned about this. We, you know, we, we feel we have to respond to this. But really, you, you notice that they actually quite like this because it gives them the uh, possibility to argue, well, we need to issue a cryptocurrency. And of course, that's what <laughs> they've all been saying. Well, not all, but most central banks have been saying. And then there's, there's again, a lot of um, sort of, well, a lot of misunderstandings out there. Um, they call the central bank digital currency and it's marketed as if, um, as if we haven't been using digital, digital currencies for many decades. Of course, the currencies that we're using are digital currencies for more than half a century. And that is bank digital currency, so BDC. It's just, we didn't call it BDC. Now we have CBDC. Uh, and the difference is, of course, one is issued by the banks. That's where our money supply um, has come from for, well, for the past many centuries. It's issued by banks. That's, that's been the system. And central banks actually only issue very little money, the paper money. Now, the central banks say, oh, it's just a modern version of paper money. Um, you know, we make it digital. It makes sense. We're in, a, in the 21st century. But that has enormous implications because as you change this one thing, everything else will, will also change. Um, and, and in concrete terms, the, um, the central bank digital currencies are essentially current accounts at the central bank. So the, the central bank is opening retail accounts to the public. And of course, that will have an enormous impact on the banking system, namely a negative one. That will change everything. Uh, it will be a game changer. And ultimately, if you, if you, you know, where will this process end? Will there be only one bank left, the central bank, and we're in the Soviet system, God's bank with one bank, and there's the decentralization. Has and if that happens, but if that happens, pretty much, you know, like um, your money, regardless of where you put it, it's pretty much going to be devalued, and your investments and your book and most companies are going to really struggle and collapse because a Soviet-style banking system isn't healthy for an economy. It's also, well, it, the other thing to keep in mind is that it gives enormous power into a very uh, small number of hands, well, you know, essentially the central bank. And human nature being what it is, we have to expect, I mean, maybe we currently have some really good central bank governors and leaders, but you know, what if we get some bad ones? Um, that's too much power in the hands um, of too few people and it's unaccountable and really it's not any more currency then it's a surveillance tool we've seen that in ottawa when uh, a law was passed for the government to um to tell the banks um of protesters peaceful protesters um that um you know you've got to shut down their access to money access to their um, current accounts at the banks and that's what they did that's what happened of course that made it obvious that the risks and dangers of such a system and with central bank digital currencies they can fine tune who is allowed to buy what and if you've uh, yeah you've you've already used up your carbon credits then your card's not going to work and anything you want you can do with this system so it's it's the end of freedom it's the most totalitarian system that you can imagine at the, at the center of it is central bank digital currencies um, so it's clear we need to do something in the opposite direction to strengthen decentralization. And here people don't realize that, you know, actually, if you have a local bank, then you have your money creation. If we have many local community banks in their communities, that's like having your own central bank. It's like having your currency. And we can do that. So just, I mean, there's a, there's a fair bit in there that if anyone hasn't been following this, there's a fair bit in there to unpack. So I think the, the best place to maybe start would be take us back to when you've seen Bitcoin and the other, these cryptocurrencies that were coming about. 
as someone who's been involved in the financial markets for as long as you have and studying them and teaching people about them, what did you see then? How did that look when you when when Bitcoin arrived? What did you think when you thought when when this was launched? Did, has your opinion changed, or did you see it right from the offset of, for what it was? Um, well, what I did notice, I mean, clearly in the beginning, um, well, what are we talking, 2010, 2011, it was very, very fringe. I mean, obviously, you know, but what I noticed is that very early on, the mainstream media would pick it up and would have big stories. And that's how it started to get better known. It's the Financial Times writing about it. But here was this fairly fringe new thing. Uh, and they had almost half page huge articles on this um, and therefore you know, propagating Bitcoin. Um, it, it didn't take long for, for Bloomberg and Reuters to actually quote Bitcoin. And these are all actually marketing tools. And at that time you couldn't justify because the, the number of transactions, the percentage of transactions taking place with that was almost nothing. And mm -hmm. therefore there was no justification. So it was clear from the beginning that some very influential people wanted to spread Bitcoin and and everything else so um you know alternative currencies so that that's certainly the impression i got so i was a bit suspicious there um and but at the same time you know with all this emphasis on on these um alternative currencies cryptocurrencies um and i believe also actually directly money even from governments for um, under the guise of fintech new industry support and then central banks supporting fin fintech quite actively it was clear there was you know establishment support and it has been successful of course you can create a lot of jobs and that it's been a huge and growing movement that in my view one should use as much as possible for the greater good and so then we came up with the idea to to do that uh, and become active in that space well and also you know, a lot of cryptocurrencies and DeFi as a sort of topic. Um, a lot of people misunderstand DeFi and DeFi cryptocurrencies, and they seem to think that, um, that the banks are the enemy and we need to have something that's not related to banks and it's gonna be decentralized finance and we are going to succeed. But what people don't realize is, is it's not the banks that are the enemy. You know, the banks are needed, they create the money supply, that needs to happen for an economy to survive and to grow. So therefore, there's no actual way a, a non-banking system can compete with a banking system because it, it, the, a non-bank system doesn't have a power of banks. They don't have the ability to create money out of nothing. Um, only banks can do that. You need a banking license. Um, so there's that misunderstanding there, thinking that banks aren't, you know, they aren't the creators of money. They aren't that important and we can just compete against it. And what we're doing is actually true decentralized finance, which is we are combining the ethos that's with blockchain and the ethos of Web3, which is doing good, decentralizing, reducing the power of a few and trying to make sure that everyone can get involved. Everyone has a voice and especially DAOs. That's what DAOs are about, giving everyone the voice. And decentralized sure autonomous organizations for the benefit of those. Who yes. um, to make sure everyone has their voice and they can speak up and it's more transparent. And what we're doing is we're combining that ethos and that way of working and that way of governing with a decentralized finance model where the banking system is actually decentralized. And that's well, what we want to do. Yeah, it sort of fits into the, it's the antithesis of the lending window that was, you wrote about the, the princes of the yen, where the asset bubble was created when, you know, the lending window basically decided which parts of the economy got lending and which didn't. And that's essentially what you're saying we need to watch out for because you can create these huge asset bubbles and Japan still hasn't recovered since the, I think it was 89, um, where this particular style of central banking where we will decide which part gets the money can cause absolute havoc. Um, you know, it can pump huge asset bubbles and, uh, you know, Japan suffered heavily from it. And it seems like what you're, you know, the path that you've came from, uh, from writing that book to now is is almost like well here's what's happened in the past here's the, the problem i've studied you know how credit creation works so look here's how it actually works um you know people the the oxymoron of the place that you might understand finance from won't write about me and that that's a bit that should maybe be a bit of a warning sign 
because I've back tested all the information and here's my experience about where it, ha where it happened before. And it looks like we're kind of heading there again. So we need to do something now and it is where you're at today. So that, what is it about um, the community banks and uh, the decentralized autonomous organization um, that, that you think is the best way forward for this? And, and why? Why does it fit now? Yes, well, it's, it is a, a modern version of the old principle that, uh, that established the community banks in the first place 200 years ago. And actually, the history is quite interesting. Um, so in Germany, they've been very strong, probably the strongest in Europe, although there is a, a very um, good history also in the UK. Um, in the early 19th century, that was even before Germany. So the, the roots, you can actually trace back to the UK, the public savings banks and then the cooperative movement. But unfortunately, they didn't take it far enough. And I suspect there was a lot of resistance from the city of London against this. Uh, and sadly, yes, George, you know, the last um, savings bank that was still operating under the 1817 Savings Bank Act Scotland, because they created an environment that was um, appropriate and allowed them to really deliver what they could. Now, that happened also in the 19th century, slightly later, but, you know, uh, maybe around mid 19th century. But that was also triggered in Germany when they shut down alternatives. Namely, in Germany around 1803 and around that time, depending on which part of Germany you're talking about, they um, secularized, as they say, the monasteries. Now, there was a, a big patchwork of monasteries across Germany. And I mean, you, you might think of monks, you know, sitting there and praying, but they were actually, um, they were very active members of their local community in, in almost every respect. Um, and in fact, they were the backbone often of the rural um, economy, and they were lending um, money as well and giving credit to all the farmers around them, among many other things, apart from brewing beer and you know, having, uh, you know, running restaurants and so on, um, and, and being farmers themselves um, and, and being scholars themselves. Um, a bit like the Chinese, you know, the Chinese have this uh, four Chinese character sayings always, and there's one, Seiko Udoku, pronounced Japanese now, um, which is when the sun shines, you, you go out and you grow things, you work on the, on the farm. And when it rains, then Udoku, then you go and study and you write. <laughs> anyway, so that, that you know, they were, they were um, multi-talented in, in those monasteries. But when these monasteries were abolished, the effect was dramatic um, and particularly felt by the farmers, the local farmers in rural communities, uh, local villages. Um, the source of credit um, was suddenly gone. So it was their access to credit that caused the problem. That, 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 if I got you there right, that it's when, the, when these were abolished. When they were abolished, exactly. These farmers struggled because Absolutely. the means of them, them yes. conducting their business was yes. the credit supplied by the monasteries. Precisely, precisely. They acted as local banks and in a friendly way, not clearly not in a sort of predatory way. Because as a bank, you always have a choice. You know, can you be, if you want to be a predator, um, like famously, you know, British big banks, RBS has been accused of that frequently having a whole department uh, whose job it was to, to kill and then dissemble, strip the assets of small firms, UK small firms, uh, quite extraordinary. But, you know, it's not the first bank, you know, this is the, um, the predatory banking that's possible. Or are you a bank that is actually dedicated to helping and, and supporting the community and ensuring that the community thrives? Now, the monasteries were on the, on the positive side, but when they were gone, the effect was traumatic. And then what happened next is the predators came in, the loan sharks, lending at very high interest rates. Oh, your farm is the collateral. Oh, you've lost your farm. Sorry. And that created a lot of destitution, um, dramatic you know, negative impact on, on life, on, uh, on life in, in local uh, rural areas and that's when they people were looking for solutions they introduced uh, local public savings banks the Sparkassen um, and also uh, 
uh, cooperative banks. And I think the idea they may have found actually in the UK is they were looking around, we need a solution, we need a solution. And, but they created, unlike the UK, then also the right regulatory and legal environment to make sure they will thrive and the right incentive structures. And that was then often copied uh, by many neighboring countries from Germany, um, certainly of course, Austria and Switzerland, but also Spain, France, Italy, they also um, had more and more of these corporate banks and public savings banks. So there's a huge boom, if you want, in that. And um, concurrently, economic growth, of course, um, rose in, in all these countries. But then there were counter movements. And in many countries, they then disappeared once small changes were made. They seemed small, but actually changed the nature of this. Uh, France, for example, you know, is a sort of very centralized country. Paris is the center. So they start to centralize and put them under one umbrella. Then it's already a different animal. You lose the uh, accountability to the local level. And therefore also then in the credit process, you know, if you always have to ask headquarters, you know, can we give that loan to that small firm? It changes the dynamics completely. It takes a long time until you get a response. Um, and the answer may be no, as nowadays, you know, computer says no, you get a loan. Um, because, of course, in the headquarters or whatever method they're using, they just don't know enough. They don't know the local counterparties. They don't know those firms. They don't know those people. Whereas um, local banks, all that institutional knowledge is there and can be utilized. And also there's mutual trust and respect. Um, and it goes both ways. And then default rates are much lower if you have a locally integrated dedicated uh, community bank and and also it's not just about refusing the loan um because of the computer saying no but also big banks generally just aren't as interested in small businesses because exactly. they are more focused on the bigger businesses which small community banks aren't looking at so yeah. they're more interested in the big businesses where they can do a lot less well the same amount of work almost the same amount of work and give out a lot more money loan a lot more money um which brings them in a, a higher margin Exactly. Um, so they're not even that interested in small business in the first place. Yeah. We found that through our research in the UK, through Local First, we found that the customer service experience by small businesses is generally very poor. Um, they very much struggle with the banking sector. They don't feel like the banks are their friends. There's no you know, good relationship with them where they feel like they can, you, you know, the bank is there to support them, um, which is the wrong sort of relationship you need. It's the wrong ethos. It's the wrong um, way for an economy to thrive. You need a banking system that's there for its people um, that, you know, focuses on the small businesses in particular because they're the ones who rely so heavily on the banking system because they can't go out to the capital markets. Uh, they can't issue bonds. Um, it's much harder for them to raise money elsewhere. So they need the banking system most. And at the moment, we found that banking systems aren't orientated for them. And something like Valhalla Network is needed to, to give the economy a boost and help those small businesses and ultimately reduce inequality. Yeah. So to recap, if I've, if I've understood this uh, correctly, let, just keep me right here if I, uh, if I go awry here. <laughs> there's, a, there's monks in a monastery uh, in Germany, and this, aside from praying, um, they are um, operating as, as uh, the community banker. They're lending uh, money to uh, the farmers people that brew beer, which I'm assuming is very popular, uh, restaurants and productive means. And that's allowed the community to thrive. They've built relationships with the people who are creating the production, as in the local businesses. That credit relationship with productivity has allowed it to thrive. Then when you centralize that, it's caused the demise of that productivity due to the lack of access of credit that was provided by these monks. And that seems to be the path that we, we are going on. And history has proven that these community style banks have not only worked where the monasteries in Germany were, but also were adopted by other countries. So if I'm understanding what you're saying properly, the idea of Valhalla is the you know monastery banking system 2.0, where you have this, we're in this wonderful environment where we can create you know, decentralized autonomous organizations. We have this decentralized cryptocurrency and we have this opportunity to look back in a time where things worked. And there is businesses here today that, that would really, really work well if something like this was around, much like the monasteries. Is that 
Would you say yes. that's a fair, a fair say, assessment? Yes, it's just worth keeping in mind that the, the token itself and the DAO, it's the, the banking system is the decentralized sort of finance, decentralized banking side of things. The DAO is for the decentralized ownership. So that the banking system is for the people, but it's also owned by the people. Um, so that the actual controlling, the ownership of the banks and deciding the best use of the, the dividends that come into the DAO um, because they own the banks. So the dividends that flow in from these community banks, which are still profitable, even though that they are community orientated, they're still very profitable. Um, how best to use that money, where to, where to effectively use that money, where should we start up new banks, where should we focus on next for another community bank, um, et cetera. So that's the purpose of the token, the DAO token. Um, is to have that decentralized ownership. The actual decentralized banking and finance itself is the banking network that we will establish. So if, if you have um, if you have a, an, an investor that, that buys your token and they're investing in this um, banking idea and they're behind this concept of right, you know, this is a 2.0 version of what worked in the past. It would work for local businesses. We want to get back to this community basis. And we would like these people that, that are involved to have a bit more of a say because it, it, it appears that that's missing just now mm -hmm. from the current system. Yes, yes. Of course, what we've seen in the past 30 years, particularly, is that banking systems have become more concentrated. Um, under the ECB, when the ECB was introduced in the Eurozone um, 22 years ago, in that time period, over 5,000 banks have disappeared. It's, of course, the small banks that disappear uh, as they get consolidated, bought up, and merged. Uh, and in the US, it's, it's similar. I mean, we're talking about thousands of banks having disappeared. In some countries, the process already took place much earlier, like in the UK. Uh, the consolidation there was before the First World War, already 100 years ago. They talk about in the UK, there's, there's a you know, government report, the Colvin report. We have a problem in the UK banking sector. The big five dominate banking. And then, of course, they already write about how they're not lending to small firms. And it's rational because big banks want to and need to do big deals. That means with big companies. Um, and that's why we actually need to do the opposite, establish small banks. What we also found in the empirical study uh, with one of my PhD students, looking at the US, which still at the moment has the largest number of banks in the world, is that because it was done over time of 20 year period, as the small banks get larger, they start to trend wise, you know, to some extent also do the same thing and then also lend to ever slightly larger companies. And that's another reason why we constantly need to set up new, very small banks. And because banking is profitable and also, you know, IT um, actually gives us many opportunities. The scale economies in IT uh, mean that we, we can do this. We can set up many small banks and they can be profitable, particularly if it's a network where they have network effects and the scale like economies. Yes, and the scale economies are uh, essentially uh, utilized on, on the network level. And then each bank, they're the owners and controllers of the network and they, um, they share in those network effects. And so that for anyone who doesn't understand what a network effect is, you know, could you explain what the power of a network effect is? Oh, yes. Well, the, actually, there's two angles. One is perhaps slightly uh, closer to what I've said, but there's a more fundamental point. Maybe I start with that fundamental point, and that is banking, unlike other industries, doesn't work um, on its own. So, you know, give an example. If you've got a BMW, that car will work, hopefully, <laughs> irrespective of what Mercedes-Benz does and you know what other car makers do, right? Because it's a separate thing. And what you know BMW does, you know, shouldn't directly um, be an input at Mercedes-Benz. But banking is different. You go to the bank and you want a standard service. Actually, the bank cannot do it most of the time without the cooperation, collaboration. And if you want collusion of the other banks, it only works when they all work together. That, of course, creates pressure for them to constantly get, you know, get closer to each other and merge. And, you know, this concentration pressure is connected to this network effect uh, on that scale. So there is a, a network aspect of banking. Banking is about being a network. But that's why it's important, and they've done this early in Germany, to have the right types of network. And the network itself has to be 
one that recognizes the importance of staying small and having benefits for the community. So in Germany, you've got the network of cooperative banks, very strong um, and has, able to, has been able to, to maintain this uh, decentralized system for 200 years. And there's the other network of savings banks, Sparkas. Um, and the, then there's the, the bigger banks, commercial banks and so on. Um, and so having a network um, is very important to utilize and capitalize on these network effects. And in banking, this is more so, more, uh, more so than in other industries because of the fact that a bank cannot operate on its own. It has to plug into the system. It's like a club and that's when you get your banking license, you, you're allowed into that club and you can transact with other banks. Yes, yeah, so, um, so to, well, to, uh, to quickly finish on Richard's point, um, it's also important to know that the small banks that have been consolidating and being acquired over time, it's not because they're failing or they are struggling. It's because they can be bought. And the big banks will see them as a very attractive, um, a very attractive business to take over and will put a very reasonable and you know good offer in and will just purchase the bank. Um, so it's important yeah, because some people... Will, will, it's cost they'll take over or are they just naming a price that's acceptable? Yes, I mean, of course, what, what may be marketed as a friendly takeover, you know, may not be all that friendly, you see, it's just, um, I mean, we see this even now that in Germany under the very bad policies by the ECB that have put enormous pressure on the corporate banks, they're forced to merge more and more. Um, and then essentially, it's, you know, there's a, there's a bigger one, and there's a smaller one. And then the management of both, they talk to each other and they come to, you know, the solution. That's not, that's not good, really. It's best if they stay separate and if they are also viable separate. And that's something we have to work for to make sure that the, the small individual local banks remain viable and don't have to merge. Um, and that, um, of course, is, is one of the, the criteria for, for designing them. And what Ollie was referring to is the um, is the alternative structure that we've designed. Um, when I set up local first, what uh, over a decade ago, local first community interest company with the um, with the goal to establish uh, those community banks. We call them not for profit community banks that confuse a lot of people. As Ollie's saying, they're actually very profitable. Um, the design is very important and the design structure has to be such that they can't be taken over easily because they will be attractive targets by anyone, and bigger we'll banks and, and so on. And just while you, while you, before you, you, you explain, because it's a great point, I know exactly what you're about to say because I've read it. Um, just before that, you, the, you mentioned that a lot of people are confused by not-for-profit. I think it's very important um, they explain this because they're so, most people will assume you mean yes. non-profit. Yes, but no, it, exactly. So, of course, um, a bank has to be, in fact, it's a regulatory requirement that a bank has to strive to be profitable. But there's a scale in terms of priority of you know, what you prioritize. And when we talk about the, uh, the standard banks, um, often their goal is just profit maximization. Whereas the community banks, they're not um, just focusing at profit maximization. They're about more than just profits. They have other goals as well. And of course, they're using their profits and their profitability. So they are profitable, but they also have other goals. They're not just one-track ponies. They just wants to, want to maximize, squeeze out as much return and profit as possible. Uh, and in fact, that's very dangerous in banking. I think there's some industries where if the profit motive is too powerful and un, uh, sort of mitigated, unhindered, then, um, then you get negative effects. Um, I mean, think about the medical industry um, or pharma maybe pharmaceutical industry is perhaps more obvious. You know, if, if you just make more money by selling pills that, yeah, have, have these side effects, which actually maybe turn out to be severe side effects, um, but you're making more money. Well, you don't care about those side effects. You actually bribe people to suppress them and, and not to write about them and whatever methods. Uh, and this has been well documented, has been going on. And so we realized that because health 
is so important, it shouldn't be just about profits when you're really active and, and very big player in the health business. Likewise, in banking, because banking is so important, not just for the economy running smoothly, but actually for society to operate and for there, for example, to be um, you know, less extreme inequality and just have a fairer system and for people to have chances and opportunities on, you know, on every level. It's so important to have the right structure and design of the banking system. Um, and that's why we can't just have one simple goal of let's squeeze out as many profits as possible. But it does not mean that you know you you're gonna have no profits because banking is the, is one of the most profitable industries there is, um, and precisely because of that, we find that when you have a bank and that is successful, there will be offers to buy it out by other players that may be very much for profit, and then that essentially would would be a problem that would disturb the, you know the the plans because then that bank will be taken out of the system and used for different um, things, and therefore. You know, I thought I have to establish a design structure that prevents these takeovers and a simple way to do this in the UK and a similar legal, in fact, in any legal environment, a sort of general way of doing this is to have the ownership of the bank, partly, um, ideally a large share, 50% in the hands of a charity that's newly established. Um, for the people of a geographically restricted area, that local area, this charity looks after the interests of the people there and owns 50% of that. And essentially, as you set up the bank, you endow that charity by giving it this 50%, and then that's a poison pill against takeovers. So Oliver, you, you, uh, you've done a very successful um, explanation of the, the banking license for, for everyone who doesn't understand about the, the club or the direction. Maybe it would be, uh, be good to, to hear your, um, your explanation of this club and uh, what that entails. One easier way of thinking about it is that banks are like magicians. Bankers are like magicians. Um, for those of you who have seen Harry Potter, you can imagine that going through the banking license application process is like going into Hogwarts and having to learn the new skills um, spend time and, and develop your skills. And then at the end, you have your wand, you, you've graduated, you've got your wand, which is your banking license. And with this wand, bankers can then create you money out of thin air. And how valuable is that wand? Well, if you've gone through the effort of going into Hogwarts and learning and, and, and you've now graduated and you've got your wand and you can create money out of thin air with this wand, people are going to offer you a lot of money for that. So intrinsically, a banking license is very valuable. And these bankers, you know, wizards everywhere, helping these small businesses and creating money to support all these small businesses. That is what's needed. And it's not just a few very powerful wizards that have the wrong goals. Yep. So to recap, you've got this situation where, if, I, if I've understood you properly, there's this you know, consumption of smaller banks from the larger banks that are, that are um, merging this into using your analogy, they're big wizards that are so far removed from the communities that the communities are being starved of this ability of the one, this credit creation that the monks provided where these communities were saying, look, if you provide the credit, we can be, we can be productive and that they're being starved. The globalization of the world and that vortex effect up the way has pulled the credit out of the communities and driven it into you know, centralized wizards who don't really know what's going on in the communities. And they don't, they don't have any interest. They, They're yeah. only interested in the big globalized players and the globalized banks and come what may to the, the other ones. If I understood you properly, the, the opportunity here is that we can see that this worked in the past, that there's there's you know, small and medium sized enterprises, you know, are a huge part of the economy. And if you can nourish those um, parts of the economy with the right type of banking service that isn't prioritized for just pure profit. And that it's like you said, that the business model of banks is when you prioritize it for profit, then you have shareholders and they want more profit and more profit. They don't really know because they're far removed. And it creates this environment where the vortex takes up, but it's profit at any cost, you know, drive it towards what we need it to be. And it sort of leaves this trail of mess 
And what you're saying is, well, we can go in here, we can create new wizards, if you like, and we can place them in the right spots and we can fix this wake that's been left uh, and solve this because not only is it a great idea in that we think it will work, in the past it's actually worked. Yeah, and we're not competing with anyone really because the small businesses that we're trying to serve are being ignored. You know, they're yeah, being they've left. What effect is that the, the, the high, the, the globalization and the you know monopolization of the banking industry has has reached a point where they're so far removed from the communities that there's not really you know anyone to fill that gap. Exactly. With the right That's structure, right. If, you, if you constructed that properly, you could plug into that gap and say, guess what? these people can, these banks and these organizations can do, continue doing what they want to do, but we can fix this, you know, mess that's been left and, and resolve it. It can be good for not only, you know, us as a bank, but in these communities and build something. And like you said, the network effect, I explained network effect recently. I says it's, um, it's a bit like if you, when there was never any telephones, if you, if you created one telephone line, it's not really worth much. And if you connect that to a second telephone, now you have you know, a, a network where you can make those calls and you connect another few lines, you keep connecting lines. Now you have this network that is just one to the, the next one to the next one. Now you have this huge effect, this network effect where it grows out. If I understand what you're, you're saying here, you're saying if we can create these little banking networks in the area, that are for the prosperity of you know, that community in that region, that network effect will grow. And to prevent the um, you know, uh, amalgamation or the merging of these banks into doing what happened before that created the mess in the first place, by creating a structure where the community has the interest in a, a, you know, a charity and you endow that charity with the, the, you know, the power to be able to have a say it's going to prevent the mess from happening again. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, so hopefully um, we can, you know, people will you know, see the benefits of, of small businesses. There's huge benefits to gain from, from a small bank. Um, and, you know, two thirds of employment is through the small businesses on average. So it's desperately needed. And it's not just us saying that, you know, small businesses benefit from small banks, you know, hidden champions. And, and it's been shown that, to, through the German Sparkasen model, for example, um, small businesses are sort of leaders in their sectors because they've got the banking network there to support them and to make sure that they can grow and they can be successful and reduce that inequality and wealth divide. Yeah, it, it does address the productivity problems in some countries like the UK. That's a big issue. It has been debated for decades. Why is productivity so low? <laughs> and it surprises those that, you know, that I mean, we do know that uh, there's a lot of invention, innovation, new patents in the UK, fundamental research, all that's there. So why is productivity low? Well, it's not about inventing new stuff. It's much, much simpler. Um, most jobs are with small firms. 70% of employment is with small firms almost everywhere in the world. And the small firms, when they get productive, then you will see it in aggregate na nationwide productivity figures. How can they be productive? Well. They need to be able to compete. Productivity is also competitiveness. They need to be competitive. How do they compete? <coughs> How can they compete? Well, they need to have the latest technologies implemented. And that's where the UK lags way behind Germany. In Germany, when a small firm uh, finds out, oh, there's this new technology in our industry, we've got to get that, otherwise we'll fall behind and we'll lose market share. All they need to do is go to their local bank that knows their firm already very well for, for, you know, for years uh, and explain, okay, we need this new technology. The bank uh, has a look at this and likely will give a response, likely will give the loan within a day. And they will be able to immediately order that equipment. And it's not about, you know, the small firm doesn't have to do new research. You just buy that as an input, you upgrade, you get the latest technology and you implement it. Whereas in the UK, They'll be struggling. They understand, oh, yeah, that would be nice to have this, but oh, that's too expensive. And oh, the bank, uh, well, forget about the bank. They're not giving us a loan. So how are we going to do it? And they start to lag behind. That's the reality. So by having local banks that know their local communities, you're 
uh, going to support small firms, which are the backbone everywhere. And you make sure that your backbone is doing well, and then you'll be doing well. The whole economy is going to do really well. And so the idea is actually very, very simple. And productivity in the UK can easily be raised if you have small, small banks, community banks. And so, Steve, you know, imagine that there's a lot of people that uh, would be behind this idea. And they're, well, they're maybe sitting there even going... Even more over the last few months, because, for example, take Canada, and we're talking about the, the shutting people off um, their money and all the fundraising that happened and the off-ramps, the cryptocurrency off-ramps just being turned off or frozen. Um, another great benefit from a decentralized banking system is decentralized off-ramps. You know, thousands of new off-ramps that can be available, um, which makes it difficult for, for, you know, a few people to just immediately say, you know, oh, we just need to freeze all these off-ramps because it's, you know, it, we don't agree with it or something like that. It's much harder to do that. Um, and the small banks are much more, you know, there's a bigger voice there. You know, the Sparkars has a very powerful voice uh, because it's such a large network of banks. And eventually, by setting up this banking network, we can also have, you know, create that voice, bring that voice to the table um, so that people aren't, the customers aren't just being treated um, in a way that might not be, you know, the benefit to, to, to them and to um, everyone else. And do you see the sentiment changing from, I mean, a lot of people who, you know, it's different for you guys who have been at the, the coal face of the world of the finance study that worked in that environment, been involved in it. And if you're in that environment, you become aware that these tools of control and security and uh, surveillance are very apparent, you know, following the money, tracing the payments, controlling what goes where. For a lot of people, they, you know, the general public, you know, poo-poo that idea. That's just somebody, you know, being dramatic. Oh, the, you know, they've had a hard week. They're just blown out of proportion, you know, and somewhat. Now Canada has happened. And look at the laws that were broken there. Look at the beliefs that people had where they thought, yeah, I am in control of my money. I can send it where I want. And it's up to me what I do with it. And they even thought that about cryptocurrencies. They even thought that about crypto. They thought it's much harder for them to just seize private people's assets and stuff. But actually, by shutting off the off-ramps, it makes it very hard for people to use cryptocurrencies. So you need a decentralized off-ramp model. I mean, you have those centralized off on and off-ramps. This, this further exasperates the problem because the, the power of that ramp is now so centralized and so controlled that it limits what people can do. Um, you know, so having a more decentralized um, system is, is, is going to combat or reinstate that idea that people can have a say and can have a voice and it's not too easy to push them in, in such a way. Um, so do you think the sentiment had changed since Canada? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I also think so. I think maybe that's even the reason why they, they sort of then um, stopped it and, and, and said, okay, well, we won't need this law anymore and so on. Forget what you've seen, you know, it didn't happen. <laughs> well, um, no, I think a lot of people woke up and and, uh, and now, of course, the central bank digital currencies continue to be pushed. You know, we've got the, um, you know, the, the digital IDs movement and so on, it will all be linked. I think a lot of people are beginning to realize that this actually could be uh, quite a nightmare and we need alternatives. So we need decentralized systems and I think community banks need to be part of this. And we pitched it at um, a local, uh, sorry, a recent Web3 Founders Festival in Munich. Uh, we were invited to pitch Valhalla Network there, and we won. Um, we won the, the uh, qualifying event. So Cryptoberfest later in the year, um, Valhalla Network will be pitched there. Um, but this was our first pitch event, and um, it sort of shows some, you know, it shows that it's being um, recognised that it's needed. And what we're actually bringing here and sort of proposing, it's not just, you know, um, a dream. It's, it's something that actually has legs, can can happen. Um, we've got the model behind it. We can, we've can we shown how we can deliver it, um, which is great to see. You know, it's, it's nice that our work is actually recognised somewhat. But we're going to have to wrap up pretty soon, George, I'm afraid. Sure. Well, this is a great, great time to, to, to uh, mention it. I mean, I imagine there's a lot of people out there who are 
sitting there thinking, yeah, I like what these guys are doing. I like what they're, they're, they're about. I like the concept of the community banks. I like the, the, the voice to be heard. I like to be in control. How did they get involved? Well, yeah, that's a good question. So in January, we launched our seed round, uh, which was oversubscribed. Um, we had a lot of support there, uh, which is great. If anyone does want to get involved now, they're able to reach out to me. Um, I'll put my email in the description and they can discuss and join in our Series A private round. If they can get in touch with you, you know, put your contact details up, their ability to, to share your ideas and concepts, because I imagine there's a lot of people out there once they hear what you guys are doing, um, will be, be very interested in getting behind this movement. Yeah, great. Awesome. Cheers, George. I appreciate, I appreciate you, um, you asking us questions today and awesome. speaking with us, um, but we'll wrap it up there. Great. Um, Thanks very much. Good talking to you. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>